שרום תל אביב, כל כך טוב להיות פה. I'm going to be totally honest, that is the most Hebrew I have spoken since my bar mitzvah. I had to practice for several hours. I'm an American, as you can tell. For further evidence, see me eating a traditional American sandwich. You can also tell I have gained some weight since I ate that sandwich. It is a full meter long, and it was delicious. I actually didn't eat it by myself. But anyway, my name is Matthew Gersman. I am an engineer at Dropbox. I work in New York. However, I spent the last week in our Tel Aviv office with our amazing Tel Aviv engineers. Can I get a cheer from Dropbox Tel Aviv? Thank you so much. It was wonderful being in their office. At Dropbox, I run a group called the JS Guild, which is a group that promotes front-end best practices. It's as though I like front-end. You can follow me on Twitter at Matthew Gersman. If you do that, it validates me. It makes me happy. And you, don't, you can also listen to me at the console log. It's a podcast where we babble about babble and other things. Finally, I put my slides up at bit.ly slash reactnextfp. So if you want to copy that, you can look at these slides later. And really, please, please, please follow me on Twitter. It makes me feel good. I posted earlier today that my entire success metric for this talk is how many new followers I have after the talk. So just do that. Make me feel good. You can unfollow me tomorrow. It's fine. So Baba, OK. I like to start with this XKCD. Who here likes XKCD? Cool. Some of you know it, some of you don't. So this is an older comic. It's probably from like 2005, and it makes a Star Wars reference about your father's parentheses, like the lightsaber in Star Wars. And <laughs> the tagline here is, I have just received word that the emperor has dissolved the MIT computer science program permanently, much like the original Star Wars. And the point of this comic is just to say that everything I'm going to tell you about today is not new information. So functional programming has been around since the 60s and even earlier. We've had Lisp forever. We've had Haskell for slightly less of a forever and Clojure kind of more recently. But these things just recently became much more popular with React and Redux. And I don't think we as front-end developers really took the time to learn the fundamentals that underlie these technologies. And that's really what I want to drive home today. So, what are we going to talk about? Well, we're going to talk about functional programming. That is in the title of my talk. We are also going to talk about declarative versus imperative styles. Equally important, what are we not going to talk about today? Well, we are not going to talk about monads. We are not going to talk about lambda calculus. We are not going to talk about functors. And I will avoid as much scary functional jargon as I possibly can while I'm giving you this talk. And there's a reason for that, and it's because functional programming is notoriously unfriendly to beginners. I love this XKCD. Why do you like it so much? Tail recursion is its own reward, because everyone in this room understands tail recursion, I'm sure. And then this tagline here, functional programming combines the flexibility and power of abstract mathematics with the intuitive clarity of abstract mathematics. Yeah, exactly, right? It, it makes no sense. And then it gets even worse. This is the Wikipedia page for Lambda Calculus. I do not know a, what a word of this means. I recognize some of these symbols. I remember them from college, but this means nothing to me. So if you read this and you understand what it means, some of you are laughing. Hopefully you find my talk entertaining, but I don't think I'm going to teach you anything new if this makes sense to you. Let's continue. So first of all, all this makes me want to drink. Who's a fan of Natalie Portman in this room? Thank God, because so, in the American version of this talk, Natalie is Taylor Swift, but I didn't think Israelis were going to care about Taylor Swift. So Natalie, who was born in Jerusalem, is going to be helping me explain functional programming. In this case, it's about how parts of it make me want to drink, and we will move on. So let's take a step back. I believe in two things. First of all, you want to use the best tool for the job. And second of all, much like this little ice cream emoji that some of you can't see in the back, moderation is key. To be fair, I believe in more than two things, but let's go with two for the moment. It's easier. <laughs> so we're going to dance with Natalie. Can everyone, it's, at the end of the day, can I just get like your goofiest dance from everyone in the crowd? Just do it. Do it for me. Come on. I'm, I'm not going to stop doing this until I see most of the crowd doing something. Sweet. That's enough. I can move on. <laughs> cool. What's the point of all this? We want to make our code more readable. We want to make it easier to reason about. We want to make our code easier to test, and we want to make our users happier. In fact, I like to say that we're optimizing for user and developer happiness. If our code is more e easier to reason about and it's more testable, then there's less bugs. It's easier to add features. Our bosses are happier. Our users are happier. We get bonuses and raises, and everyone in the industry is happy when our code actually works for a change. So when is functional programming most useful? And 
this isn't to say it's only useful in this construct, but I really like to narrow it down because this is like one case where it just always seems to work, and that is when we're doing a one-to-one -one data transformation. And what do I mean by that? Well, in a standard React Redux app, you have Redux in the back as your data store, and you have your presentation layer in the front, and then in the middle, you have a functional selector layer or with Lodash kind of in the middle, and uh, in this case, I'm using Lodash, but many of these features are now in ES6. You can also use Ramda or Immutable or anything that doesn't cause the next smoosh gate. I'm fine with it. But anyway, we're going to zero in on this functional selector layer. And I have these types defined. So in the back, I have my user map, which has a list of users keyed by ID for, for near instant lookup time, which is usually what you want in a database. And then in the front, I have a component, which takes a list of users and spits out JSX. Maybe it's avatars, maybe it's usernames. I don't really care. It's just it needs that array of users. And that's where this functional selector layer comes in, convert user map to array. We take a map of users, and we convert it to an array. And that's what we're going to zero in on further. So let's take another step back and define the thing. So what is functional programming? Functional programming, often abbreviated FP, which is so much easier to say, is the process of building software by composing pure functions. Now, what's a pure function? A pure function is a function which, given the same inputs, always returns the same outputs and has no side effects. So 2 plus 2 is always 4. 3 times 3 is always 9. Dan Abramoff tweets something, and everyone in this room goes crazy. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. It's, I, that's basically a pure function to me. And I'm going to give you some examples of side effects. And again, these are not evil things. These are not bad things. These are things that happen in our code that we want to isolate, and we'll get to that further. But first, let's cover some examples. So the first one is mutation. I have a function called pop. I hope most of you are familiar with the idea of popping something off of an array. And in this case, we are taking the first element off. And if we repeatedly call pop on this array, it's going to return a new value every time. So it's not pure, even though the input, the reference to the array, is the same. And eventually, it'll just start returning an empty array, which I guess is fine. But it's just not a pure function, and it's mutating the underlying value. Another example is shared state. So you've probably seen something like this before, where you have a semi-globally scoped variable. And these increment and decrement functions are returning i++ and i++. Minus minus. And depending on the order we call them depends on what's going to happen. So we just don't know what to expect out of either one of these. And what if you set i to some arbitrary number? What if you set i to a string? Fun fact, string++ plus plus is not a number. What if you said it's undefined? Undefined++ plus plus is not a number. But wait, it's JavaScript. Null++ plus plus is 0. No minus minus is zero. So just don't do this. <laughs> and then finally, async code, which we absolutely have to do. Like we are writing at web applications. These things persist to servers. They persist to local databases. We need promises. Async code is a thing that we're eventually going to have to do. But we should just isolate it and understand that it is going to be a side effect and that it can cause issues in our code. Or this is where the bug is most likely to occur is really the thing that we want to remember. So in this case, when I, console log, when I call in increment async and then I console log twice, we don't actually know what value is going to be logged at any given point. Natalie wants to be perfect. None of our applications are perfect. If they were perfect, we wouldn't have jobs. So I'm kind of glad there are bugs. So this is the most important thing I want you to remember. And I will repeat this many, many times today. Isolate your state and isolate your side effects. I think. Uh, Michelle and Robert's talks earlier gave a great example of these as well, but really we just want to isolate those two things and our code will be more predictable. So much like my boy Harry Potter here says, I'll be in my bedroom making no noise and pretending that I don't exist. Second book. Cool. So let's look at an example, and I'm going to be bringing in some more Harry Potter, as you're about to see. So I have this first function clone, which takes an object, and it copies over the object to a new reference. And then I have a second function called kill parents, and it takes a wizard. Thank you. So it takes the wizard, and we mark the wizard's parents as dead, because obviously a, a function that kills parents isn't going to be pure. And then we return the wizard. Then I have another function that adds the scar to the wizard, and it marks wizard.scar equal true. And I call these functions in order. So Harry, and then I clone him, then I kill his parents, and then I give him a scar, and that's the order that happened in the book, so I get to feel good about myself. And what you're probably expecting this code to do just by reading it is Harry, Harry, Harry dead parents, Harry dead parents, and a scar. Is that what we're going to get? No, we're going to get Daniel Radcliffe in an array of outfits, some maybe not matching his personality type. 
Sweet, thank you. This is what we're actually going to get. We're going to get Harry and then Harry Scar Parents, Harry Scar Parents, and Undefined. What just happened? Well, C and D, or Kill Parents and Add Scar, were both operating on the same reference to an object. And then D, fun fact, I hit a bug in Add Scar. It doesn't return anything. So that one's undefined. So this code is just like not terribly predictable. OK, so you're, you're wondering, why did I put this freaky black swan gif up here? And then uh, this was even more stressful. And then I cried about it. And then who here saw this talk or knows what I'm about to talk about? Just cool. Some of you do, some of you don't. So I feel like every other speaker today, hooks came out a week ago, and we all had to shoehorn hooks into our talks. So I'm going to do this in like a minute, if I can, just to speed through it and talk about why hooks are not an issue here. Cool. Hooks are state and hooks are side effects. That is OK. If we look at this impure component, which is probably the exact same component someone else used earlier because I copied it from the React docs, I've bolded the places where we're using state and we're producing side effects. And this is actually really nice. Like The only difference is this used to be in a class component, and now it's in a function. So we can't be sure that all functional components are stateless. But if you look at the React docs, again, isolate your state and isolate your side effects. Right in the docs, it says, don't call hooks from regular JavaScript functions. Only call hooks from React functions. And then I highlighted this when I took the screenshot, because I really cared. Following this rule, you ensure that all stateful logic in a component is clearly visible from its source code, which is the point of isolation, right? We want to make the things that are most likely to go wrong easiest to find. That's why we isolate state and side effects. Sweet. I get to move on from hooks. I have Natalie in the SNL wrap, super excited. Let's talk about declarative and imperative code. So declarative code describes what it does. Imperative code describes how it does it. So we all, this is a React conference, so I just kind of assume that you all trust React semi-implicitly. Um, and this React component will take a counter, which is a prop, and it just spits out a span that is the counter at that point in time. Flicker. Anyway. So, React will update the DOM, and we will just trust React to keep the DOM up to date. This is very similar to saying hiring a painter and saying, I want my walls to be blue. And then the painter goes and makes your walls blue, and you don't really tell, it, tell him or her step by step how to do that. Imperative code describes exactly what it's doing. So this update counter function is going to grab a DOM node and get the element and update the inner HTML. It's going to do a terrible job with conflicts. It is going to block. It is going to cause a list of issues. And on top of that, this just doesn't scale well, which is why we're here, why we're using React. But I don't think a lot of us took, got the chance to learn the difference between declarative and imperative when we were learning React in the first place, and that's really important. And this is the same thing as you know, deciding instead of hiring a painter that you're going to drive to the store and pick up the can and paint the wall. And maybe that's cheaper, maybe that's not. Maybe it's harder to paint a mansion versus an apartment. I don't know. But that's why we hand this off to a declarative library. Which, which we just say, hey, we trust you to do your job. And the other thing I want to note is that declarative code always ends up either compiling down to or being processed by something imperative. So you hire a painter, you are hiring them to imperatively paint your walls. If you use React, it is doing DOM mutations under the hood. And even if you're using something like Lisp or Haskell, eventually it's compiling down to machine code. And there is an imperative nature to it. It's just we want to keep that imperative code out of our code so that way it's more predictable and easier to reason about. <coughs> so let's look at a couple examples. This first one is get file map by ID. Who, who has written code that looks like this before just, just by looking at it, right? You're like, you're taking a list of files and you're keying them by ID so you can look at them real quickly. And this is eight lines of code and this works, but only a handful of you immediately knew what this did. So I assume the rest of you would have to read this for three minutes, and then you'll understand it, because it's pretty straightforward. But <laughs> what if a file doesn't have an ID? What if uh, we have collisions? What if uh, the other thing is, did you know there's a faster way to do for loops? Don't do this in your code ever, but if you combine your increment and your exit clause, you'll save yourself a few milliseconds. And that's actually what Lodash does under the hood. So lodash.keyby, which once you've kind of gotten used to, it's just like, oh, it's keying the files by ID. It does those stupid optimizations under the hood that we should never do in our code, and we just trust it to work. A similar example is getting a list of names off of a list of files. So in this case, we hit want to loop through the files and grab the name property off of each one. This is just a map. Map is actually an ES6. You don't even need Lodash. And it loops over the files, and it does a one-to-one -one transform 
over the files to grab the name property off of each one, and then it returns that new list. It's a transformation of a list to a new kind of list. So Baba, it's a, a lot of stuff. I just talked really fast, right? So I want to give you all a mental break, but I don't know how to stop talking. This is a problem I have. So I'm going to go on a non-technical rant for about 40 seconds to entertain myself, and you all can just ignore me. So let's talk about Natalie Portman's career. <laughs> she was in her first film when she was 12 years old. This movie is called Leon. I watched it while I was prepping for this talk. I had never seen it before. She is hanging out with an assassin and smoking cigarettes. It is awesome, and it is so 90s. And she was 15, and she was in Star Wars. Like, forget everything you think about the prequels. Like, 15 years old and cast in the first Star Wars in a decade. That is a, an achievement. And she was in Garden State, which, by the way, I'm weird, man, just describes me. Second of all, who here knows the soundtrack to Garden State? This is, like, one of my favorite movie soundtracks of all time. Thank you. You all are great. I'm a big fan of you. And then she was in V for Vendetta. Look at this. She really shaved her head for this scene. She is actually crying. That is not acting. And then Black Swan, which you've already seen, creepy. I watched this on the plane, and then I had trouble sleeping on the plane. I regretted that. Then she was in Thor. She jumps to a Marvel movie. And then finally, last one, don't worry, we're done. Then she played Jackie Kennedy, who just has an unbelievable amount of poison grace. And it, her range is just insane. So we are going to move on now. Your brains have now had a break. Let's go back to some functional concepts. And this should be like Harry Potter getting his wand with these functional concepts. So I'm going to do these in pairs. The first two are separation and composition, and I'll talk about them together. So separation says that if you try to perform effects and logic at the same time, you might create hidden side effects which cause bugs in the logic. We want to keep functions small, and we want to do one thing at a time, and we want to do it well. Composition pairs really nicely with this. We want to write functions whose outputs will naturally work as an input to many other functions. We should keep function signatures as simple as possible. So let's look at some code. So I have this function, sort files by name. Hey, I work for Dropbox. I think about files a lot. And we're going to sort the files by name, and that's a, a one-liner. I have another one-liner that is get PDF files in FP. Filter is a filter in as opposed to a filter out. Uh, filter is actually built into ES6 now, so you don't even have to use Lodash, like I said before. But so in this case, we are only including files whose extension is a PDF. And then the final one, get file names, is the same map that you saw a couple minutes ago. And these combine really, really nicely. So lodash.flow is a lodash utility that exists in every other functional library. It also might be coming to ECMAScript with the pipeline operator, which I believe is in like stage one or two. I'm not following that too closely. But anyway, we take what this does is it takes get PDF file names, passes its output to get file names, and then passes its output to lodash.sortby, because now it's just an array of strings. And this is functionally equivalent to what's on the bottom. So on the bottom, you can read, and this is probably more like what the code you're used to looks like, get PDF files, its output gets passed to get file names, and its output gets passed to sort by, and that's the new function. And what I want to encourage you to do is think about what's best for your team. If you're working on a team of five and everyone thinks Flow is awesome, go with Flow. It has some micro-optimizations, does some nifty things with the call stack. I like it. You can, flow up, you can flow float functions into other float functions, and it works super well. But if you've got 200 engineers and they're going to look at this and be like, what is this Flow thing? Maybe go for the second one. That's up to you. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just here to, te to teach things. Next concepts. I think this is hilarious. I got it from an article called The Tao of Immutability. I cited my source even so you can find it when you look up these slides. The true constant is change. Mutation hides change. Hidden change manifests chaos. Therefore, the wise embrace history. And we talked about immu immutability a lot today, especially in the Emmer talk. But I don't know if we discussed why we like immutability. The nice thing about immutability is we can just say, hey, has anything changed? If so, re-render my entire application, because chances are it is cheaper to re-render your entire React DOM tree at the React layer than it is for you to compute upstream what has changed and make the DOM mutation yourself. And that's really a lot of what we rely on. So memoization is an optimization technique. Who, who's done memoization in, who's actually done this for their job? Raise your hand. Now who's done it for a technical interview? 
I always think it's more for the technical interview than for the job. But anyway, what we're doing is we are remembering with a pure function that if we have a given set of inputs and the output's always going to be the same, let's just remember what happened the last time we called it with those inputs. So if it's 2 and 2 and returns 4, we're just going to remember that those were the inputs and this is the output and we don't have to do that computation. Now, that example is relatively cheap, but you could imagine a much more expensive example oh, with something else going on under the hood. So. Now let's look at some more sample code, and I'm sorry this is about to get dark. Also, if you haven't read the seventh Harry Potter book, I'm really sorry, but it's been 10 years. So we have a function. It's called kill sibling, and it takes a wizard. And it's immutable, so it copies over the wizard, and then it decrements the number of siblings the wizard has. And I realize there's like some potential bugs here, like negative siblings and stuff, but I needed this to fit in one slide, so please ignore that. And we're going to memoize the function kill sibling. And we are going to take Ron Weasley, who has six siblings in the first book, and we are going to pass him to kill sibling memoized. And if we do a strict equality check of Ron and Ron after Fred dies, it's going to return false. Of course they're not equal. He's a different person now. His brother died. Yes. Second of all, <laughs> um, wow, no one ever laughs at that joke. Anyway. Second of all, we now know that something has changed and we have to re-render our application. Now, the nice thing about this memoized layer is if we call it again on Ron, the same input, the same reference, then Ron after Fred dies and Ron after Fred dies again returns true because it's the same, it was the same input, so we know it was the same output. And this is actually how, like, for example, create selector works under the hood, or for example, react.memo is going to work under the hood, where it's just, hey, we know nothing's actually changed, we're not going to bother to re-render. Now, I do want to note the caveat that if we call the inner function without memoizing it, kill sibling on Ron, it is always going to return a new object. So in this case, I made Ron after movie Fred dies, and we compare it to Ron after Fred dies, and those are not a strict equality check, even though they happen to have the same internals. So you want to be careful about that, and that's why tools like Immer are so great. The other thing I want to note is that Ron in the movies and Ron in the book are two entirely different characters. Yes, I put a slide about this. So in the first movie, there's a scene where they are struggling against this evil plant, and Ron is just like, I'm helpless. I can't do anything. In the book, he's like, I don't have my wand on me. Hermione, you have yours. Cast a fire and fix this. There's another scene in the movies where Snape is bullying Hermione, and in the movie, Ron just says, yeah, like he's right. You are a know-it-all. In the book, he stands up for her and gets detention. So anytime someone talks trash about Ron Weasley, just he is underrated. Please appreciate him. Can I get a round of applause for Ron Weasley? It'll make me happy. Yeah, I bet you didn't see yourself doing that today. Cool. We're back to technical stuff again. That was a sneaked in break for you. High order functions. She thinks these are a bit of light reading, and she is the appropriate amount of rated, neither over nor under. Hermione and Emma Watson are great. Higher order functions, and just to put this in your head, higher order components. Higher order functions are in math and computer science a function that does one of two things, or both. It can take a function as one of its arguments or, and or return a function as its result. So who here knows callbacks? You've probably done callbacks. Yeah, we're, we're, we're front-end developers. We do this. So fetch creates a promise, and then then is the higher order function that takes a callback or takes a function as its parameter and then calls it later. Another example is a function that returns a function. So closures, people know closures kind of, yeah. So in this case, we have some bound state inside of this function because the counter generator is returning a function that is bound to the i variable inside of it. And every time we call this new function, it's going to log a new number. Interesting note, or at least I find it interesting, counter generator itself is a pure function because it's always returning a fresh state, whereas counter is not because it has some type of internal state that's always changing. And like I said, that's OK. It's just about isolation. And then finally, a function that takes a function and returns a function, which you have already seen many times today. We have lodash.memoize, which took kill sibling and memoized it. We had flow, which took three functions and then put the chain those together. And then just to prove that I could still write code, I did it again with debounce. So debounce is a function that doesn't call the function until it's been done being called for a period of time. And if we call cast spell debounce three times in a row, it only logs expelliarmus once. Sababa. So, Next. OK, this is the last topic. It's scary, but it's cool. We're going to get through it. Currying and partial application. This is, this is the stuff that you don't necessarily need to know, but I think it's cool, and we've covered all the basics. 
Currying is the technique of translating evaluation of a function that takes multiple arguments into evaluating a sequence of functions, each with a single argument. And to be honest, it actually changes dramatically by implementation. So Lodash has its own implementation, Ramda has its own implementation, and even languages like Haskell and Lisp have their own implementation of currying. But we're going to focus on the Lodash implementation, and I think that'll kind of get the basic gist across. So we have this function called sum, which takes A, B, and C, and it adds them up. Hopefully you know what that function does. Now we're going to pass it to lodash.curry, and it produces a new function, curried sum. And if I call it with 1, 2, and 3, it'll return 6, and it just works, and it does what we expect it to. If I call it with just 2 and 3, it produces a new function that is waiting on the third argument. And the same thing can be said if I pass it one or two arguments. It produces a new function that is waiting for up to the number of arguments it needs to execute. And this is literally what a Redux middleware does under the hood. If you've ever looked at the Funk middleware, for example, or any other middleware for that matter, where it's like, ac where it's like action, next, et cetera, that's, that's all currying. It's just passing single functions that take single arguments around and binding parameters to them. Next topic, partial application, which is very similar. It's kind of like currying is about taking a function and making it a f take multiple arguments or take single ar singular arguments. Partial application is about binding arguments to a function. So partial application refers to the process of fixing a number of arguments to a function producing another function of smaller arity. I know I promised no functional jargon, but it's one word, and you get to go home saying you learned this word. So arity, it's the term for a number of arguments a function takes. That some function, its arity was three. So now you know this new word. And we'll show some examples of partial application. And look, I have a wizard spell, and we're not killing anyone. No one's parents are dying. We're just learning spells. It's great. So we're going to copy over. So we have this function called learn spell, which takes a spell and a wizard. And you'll note that I've actually put these parameters in a good order for partial application. And we're going to splat over the wizard, because we're not using Immer, and we have to go do this the deep immutability way. And then we are going to copy over all the spells the wizard knows. And then we are going to append the final spell, the thing that they're learning. And I have these two functions, learn Expelliarmus and learn Expecto Patronum. And I can partially apply those strings to this function, and now it just needs to take a wizard. So I can just reuse these as much as I want. And if, say, for example, the shape of the wizard were to change, all I have to change is that inner function. Those outer functions are reusing the inner code, which is quite nice. <laughs> so in this case, I call those two functions in order on Harry Potter, and you see what happens. He learns those spells in that order. It's the same order it happened in the books, and I get to feel good about myself knowing that I talked about Harry Potter at a React conference. Sweet, and you've already seen this. So if we look back to some of the code I wrote earlier, we have sort files by name, get PDF files, get file names. These are all partial applications. So files is going to sort by, we're binding name to the right. In this case with filter, we're binding extension PDF to the right. And in this case with map, we're binding name to the right. So these are all using lodash.partial right is your other option. And the thing I want to remind you of with the exact same thing I said with flow is do what's best for your team. If you think the top one is more readable and more maintainable, go with it. It's certainly easier to stick a console log in there or a debugger statement in there. If you think the bottom one is more readable or just nicer, go with that. I don't care. It's up to you. The one thing I really do want to remind you of, though, is that debugging is harder than writing code. So if you write the cleverest code you can, you are therefore not smart enough to debug it. I have experienced this in person. So, trust me. And if we take a step back, we remember what we're optimizing for, right? We want to make our code more readable. We want to make it easier to reason about. We want to make our code easier to test. And we want to make our users happier. That's kind of the goal here. And if you take one thing home away from this talk, isolate your state, isolate your side effects. Fireworks for that. I have one more XKCD. Haskell has no side effects because it's code that no one ever runs. That's hilarious. You can look that up later. I have some other resources that I do not have time to go in depth for, but my slides are again up there. You can look those up. We're not taking questions. We covered that today. And then one more time, I still have not been validated. Please pull out your phones and follow me on Twitter, or I will cry tonight when I look at my phone and see that nobody enjoyed my talk. So thank you very much. My name is Matthew Gerstmann. I also snuck in bit.ly slash fpnatalie for you, now that you get that joke. <laughs>